hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beep sound. You will have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extract once only. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you will hear two different extracts. In each extract, a healthcare professional is talking to his patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. Please be seated. Is she your daughter? Yes, doctor. What's her name and what's her complaint? Her name is Tierra. She gets shortness of breath with vigorous play and exercise. She gets tired more quickly than the children of her age. Does she have coughing, wheezing, or chest congestion? No, doctor. What's her age? Six years old, doctor. Moreover, when she runs and races, she seems to have severe problems as it seems to take her a significantly long period of time to catch her breath. Was she admitted to any hospital earlier? No, doctor. She needed an apnea monitor after birth, and this was continued for approximately three months thereafter. At times, she has nasal congestions during the night and morning hours. What medications is she taking now? Nothing, doctor. Is she allergic to any medicine? No, doctor. Her immunizations are up to date? Yes, doctor but she is yet to have influenza vaccine. While her pulmonary function test shows premature ventricular contraction, it is 1.21 liters, that is 77% of predicted. The FEV1 is 1.9, that is 81% of what we predicted. Peak expiratory flow is 175 liters per minute, that is 82% of predicted. Post bronchodilator, she has no change in the forced vital capacity or FEV1. She had a 10% improvement in the peak expiratory flow up to 195 liters per minute. Her forced expiratory flow is 25 to 75% increased to 2.5 liters per second, which is a 28% improvement. Her borderline normal lung volumes is measured by the forced vital capacity and FEV1 and her flows are in the normal range, although there is some improvement seen post-bronchodilator. This would indicate that she has some airway reactivity. I have reviewed her recent chest x-ray. I have also reviewed the echocardiogram report, which shows normal. She has developed dyspnea with exertion, etiology unknown may be reactive airways disease, a potential cause. She has rhinitis, probably vasomotor and infectious. I am going to start albuterol HFA as pro-air and proventil two puffs via Inspir-Ease every four hours and 15 minutes prior to vigorous exercise. She can use either Claritin 10 milligrams or Zyrtec 10 milligrams daily for rhinitis symptoms and she may also use Sudafed, 30 milligrams every six hours for significant nasal congestion. Continue these medications for two months and meet me thereafter. Okay, thank you, doctor.
Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. What's your problem? Well, I have a headache and pulsatile tinnitus. For the past three months, I've been getting severe headaches and almost daily. I'm getting pulsations in the head with heartbeat sounds. Exactly at which point of your head do you feel pain? On top of my head. Are you getting nausea or vomiting associated with the headaches? No, doctor. Is there any previous history of headaches? No, doctor, but apart from last three months. What's your age? 44, doctor. When I speak on the phone, I get weird sounds in my left ear. I get pulsating sounds only in left ear. When did this problem start, actually? Well, actually, the ear pulsations began following a flight trip to my native place. Is there any drop or change in hearing? No, doctor. But I had dizzy episodes in the past with nausea being imbalanced at times. Is there any change in your vision? No, doctor. Well, do you smoke or drink? I do not consume alcohol, but I used to smoke one pack a day, and now I have completely stopped it. Have you had any previous illness or surgeries? I had skin cancer on my arm and back. I am a kidney donor, so I had a left nephrectomy, C-sections, mastoidectomy, laparoscopy, and temporal arthrodysis. What medications are you taking? Tylenol, Excedrin, and a multivitamin and probiotic. Are you allergic to any medicine? Yes, to codeine and penicillin. Tell me your family history of illness. Well, my father has a cancer, hypertension, and heart disease. Hmm. Your physical examination shows your blood pressure at 120 over 78. Pulse, 64 and regular, and the temperature is 97.4. Cardiovascular test shows regular heart rate and rhythm without murmur. There is an old mastoidectomy scar on your left ear. Weber exam is midline. Grossly hearing is intact. You have pulsatile tinnitus. Left ear with eustachian tube disorder as the etiology. There's also a possibility of normal pressure hydrocephalus, deviated navel septum, dizziness, probably due to possible Meniere disease. I would recommend you to start a 2 gram less sodium diet. I am ordering a carotid ultrasound study as part of the workup and evaluation. Since your disease is related to your station tube, I'm prescribing Nasacort AQ nasal spray, one spray each nostril daily. You use the hearing protection devices at all times. I will recheck you in three weeks. If the pulsatile tinnitus does not improve, then I would recommend other treatments, including myringotomy or ear tube placement. You have to undergo for an audio and tympanogram prior to the treatment procedure. This is the end of Part A. Now, look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at the question 25. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of blood tests for leukemia? Well, blood tests, such as complete blood count, can detect leukemia. 
A complete blood count determines the number of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Cytogenetics analysis is a blood test in which a sample of blood is examined to check for changes in the chromosomes of the lymphocytes. Peripheral blood smear determines the presence of blast cells and shows the type and quantity of white blood cells. Other various blood tests may be ordered to see how organs are functioning and if they are being affected by leukemia. Question 26. Doctor, could chemotherapy inside the bladder reduce recurrence of cancer? According to a recent study, patients who had the chemotherapy drug gemcitabine placed inside their bladder following the resection of the tumor had few recurrences. Put of more than 400 subjects, 384 completed the trials and were included in the study, which randomized them to receive the chemotherapy drug called gemcitabine to treat the bladder cancer. They implanted it into the bladder and let it settle there for an hour in the other group with saline without gemcitabine in it. They kept the patients under observance for every three months for two years, thereafter every six months for another couple of years. What they observed was the recurrence were 34% less. The purpose of this study was to prevent bladder cancer from invading the muscle wall of the organ. Moreover, this is a very simple method without any significant side effects. Question 27. Doctor, could keeping our immune system under control be as easy as managing our diet? Well, for instance, the immune cells involved in multiple sclerosis mainly depend on sugar to activate the disease. However, the common drug for multiple sclerosis, dimethyl fumarate, blocks this energy pathway. Contrarily, these energy pathways are feasible targets to treat certain diseases that might extend to dietary measures. I'd like to be extremely cautious about this because nowadays diseases and diets have become very common. However, the theory that energy metabolism is crucial in the way the immune system reacts suggests that there are possibilities that different kinds of diets are going to have impact on our immune system that we're just starting to understand but are yet to understand it completely. I wonder at some stage if the autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis may include diet as part of the disease management strategy, as well as other diseases where immune system and energy metabolism are essential, such as cancer. Question 28. Valentidium coli is an intestinal protozoan parasite that can infect human beings, which are transmitted through the fecal-oral route by contaminated water and food. Although Valentidium coli infection is mostly asymptomatic, patients with other severe illnesses can experience abdominal pain, persistent diarrhea, and sometimes a perforated colon. Valentidium coli is a parasitic species of ciliate alveolates that causes the disease Valentidiasis, which is the only member of the ciliate phylum known to be pathogenic to humans. Question 29. Hello, doctor. What is schistosomiasis, and what are its causes? 
schistosomiasis, also termed as bilharzia, is caused by parasitic worms. Although these worms are not found in the U.S., more than 200 million people are affected worldwide by this disease. In terms of impact, this disease stands next to malaria as the most devastating parasitic disease. Schistosomiasis is also considered one of the neglected tropical diseases. The parasites causing schistosomiasis dwell in certain types of freshwater snails. The infectious form of the parasite, known as cercariae, emerge from the snail, therefore contaminating water. Most human infections are caused by schistosoma mansoni, S. japonicum, or S. hematobium. One can become infected when the skin is exposed to contaminated fresh water. Question 30. Hello, Doctor. What is hypoxia, and what are its causes? Well, hypoxia means low oxygen, but is described as a deficiency in the amount of oxygen that reaches the body tissues. Hypoxia differs from hypoxema, which means insufficient amount of oxygen in the blood. In hypoxic hypoxia, or hypoxema, the tissues do not get adequate amount of oxygen since there is a lack of oxygen in the blood flowing to the tissues. Generally, hypoxic hypoxia is caused due to inadequate breathing and other causes. In anemic hypoxia, low levels of hemoglobin lead to a decreased ability of the blood to carry oxygen that we breathe in. Therefore, the tissues get a diminished supply of oxygen. The stagnant hypoxia, or circulatory hypoxia, is caused due to inadequate blood flow, resulting in less oxygen supply to the tissues. In histotoxic hypoxia, the tissues are incapable of utilizing the adequate amount of oxygen available, despite the adequate oxygen inhaled through the lungs and delivered to the tissues. Metabolic hypoxia occurs when there is excessive demand for oxygen by the tissues than usual. Oxygen may be absorbed transported and used properly by the tissues. However, due to a condition that raises metabolism, it is still insufficient. Sepsis is a perfect example of this. This is the end of Part B. Now, look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer, A, B, or C, which best fits according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at extract 1. Extract 1. For questions 31 to 36.
Kaposi sarcoma is a type of cancer that forms from the cells that line blood vessels or lymph. It usually looks like tumors on the skin or on mucosal surfaces, such as inside the mouth. However, Kaposi sarcoma tumors can also develop in other parts, such as in the lymph nodes, digestive tract, or the lungs. The abnormal cells of Kaposi sarcoma form red, purple, or brown tumors or blotches on the skin. These affected areas are known as lesions. Often the skin lesions of Kaposi sarcoma appear on the face or legs. However, usually they cause no symptoms. Certain lesions on the groin area or legs may cause a painful swelling on the legs and feet. Kaposi sarcoma can cause severe problems or even become life-threatening when the lesions are in the digestive tract, liver or lungs. For instance, Kaposi sarcoma can cause bleeding, while tumors in the lungs may cause trouble breathing. The different types of Kaposi sarcoma are defined by the different populations it develops in. However, the changes within the Kaposi sarcoma cells are very similar. Epidemic Kaposi sarcoma or AIDS-related Kaposi sarcoma. The most common type of Kaposi sarcoma in the U.S. is epidemic or AIDS-related Kaposi sarcoma. This type of Kaposi sarcoma develops in people who are infected with HIV. However, a HIV-infected person does not necessarily have AIDS. The virus may be present in the body for a long time, often many years before causing any illness. The disease called AIDS outbreaks when the virus completely damages the immune system, resulting in certain types of infections or other medical complications, including Kaposi sarcoma. When HIV damages the immune system, patients infected with a certain virus are more likely to develop Kaposi sarcoma. Kaposi sarcoma is considered an AIDS-defining illness. That is when Kaposi sarcoma occurs in the patients infected with HIV. That patient officially has AIDS. In the U.S., treating HIV infection with highly active antiretroviral therapy has resulted in fewer cases of epidemic Kaposi sarcoma. Yet, certain patients develop symptoms of Kaposi sarcoma in the first few months of highly active antiretroviral therapy. For HIV patients, highly active antiretroviral therapy can often progress the Kaposi sarcoma development. However, Kaposi sarcoma can occur in people whose HIV is well under control with highly active antiretroviral therapy. Once Kaposi sarcoma develops, it is still essential to continue highly active antiretroviral therapy. In the regions where highly active antiretroviral therapy is not accessible, Kaposi sarcoma in AIDS patients can advance quickly. Classic or Mediterranean Kaposi sarcoma occurs mainly in older people of Mediterranean, Middle Eastern, and Eastern European heritage. Classic Kaposi sarcoma is more common in men than in women. Patients have one or more lesions on their ankles, legs, or the soles of the feet. Compared to other types of Kaposi sarcoma, the lesions in classic Kaposi sarcoma do not grow quickly and new lesions do not form as often. The immune system of patients with classic Kaposi sarcoma is not as weak as it is in those who have epidemic Kaposi sarcoma, but it may become weaker than normal. When this occurs, people who already have a Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus infection are more likely to develop Kaposi sarcoma, endemic Kaposi sarcoma, or African Kaposi sarcoma. Endemic Kaposi sarcoma occurs in people in equatorial Africa. Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus infection is very common in Africa, therefore the risk of Kaposi sarcoma very high. Probably there are other factors in this region that weaken the immune system, such as malnutrition, malaria, and other chronic infections, which may also contribute to the development of Kaposi sarcoma. Endemic Kaposi sarcoma occurs in younger people under 40. Rarely an aggressive form of endemic Kaposi sarcoma is seen in children before puberty. This type of Kaposi sarcoma usually affects the lymph nodes and other organs and can progress quickly. Latrogenic Kaposi sarcoma or transplant-related Kaposi sarcoma.
when Kaposi's sarcoma develops in patients whose immune systems have been damaged after an organ transplant. It is known as eotrogenic Kaposi's sarcoma or transplanted related Kaposi's sarcoma. Most transplant patients should take drugs to keep their immune system from rejecting the new organ. But by weakening the immune system of the body, these drugs increase the chance that patients infected with the herpes virus will develop Kaposi's sarcoma. Discontinuing such immunosuppressive drugs or lowering the dose often makes Kaposi's sarcoma lesions go away or get smaller. Now, look at extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. Hello, doctor. Can you please explain different types of epidermal nevi? Epidermal nevi are categorized based on their clinical features, by the site of occurrence, and their extent of spread. However, mostly they are categorized based on the epidermal cell that predominates in the lesion. In certain patients, multiple epidermal nevi occur along with systemic abnormalities, and they form the epidermal nevus syndromes. Based on the occurrence patterns, epidermal nevi are categorized differently despite the similarity in their microscopic appearance. Nevus varicosus occurs as a single or multiple lesions but always localized. Nevus urineus lateris occurs as a linear pattern of lesions. Ichthyosis hystrix are generalized lesions. However, epidermal nevi are also classified by their cell of origin. Nevus sebaceous are quite common and are made up of sebaceous glands with or without hair follicles. They're found commonly on the scalp, but also on the extremities or trunk, and are pale yellow in color, with a smooth, hairless surface. They are present in infants, though they may manifest only after puberty or in childhood. One-fourth of the cases eventually give rise to tumors, and are mostly benign. Often it is connected with the occurrence of Schimmelpenning syndrome, phacomatosis, Pigmento keratotica, didymos aplastic sebacea, and scalp syndrome. Keratinocytic epidermal nevus are also called non-organoid epidermal nevi and are quite common among this group of lesions. They follow the lines of Blaschko and begin as brownish macules, thicken and darken with age to become plaques. They may be defined as linear or varicose based on their appearance. Other variants include the epidermolytic epidermal nevus, the acantholytic epidermal nevus, and the systemized epidermal nevus. Nevus comedonicus are formed of proliferated dilated keratinized follicles, often inflamed or showing signs of infection as a result of blockage, forming blackheads, and pitting is often seen. It may be associated with brain abnormalities, bone defects, and cataracts. The angora hair nevus is remarkable for the long and soft white hair, 
like angora wool, that grows from it. It may be associated with other defects of the brain and bones. The Becker nevus is a dark patch of hairy skin that appears like a checkerboard shape, becoming larger and darker after puberty due to androgen-dependent nature. Often it is found on the upper part of the back or on the shoulders. It is linked with other skeletal muscular defects, forming the Becker nevus syndrome. Inflammatory linear varicose epidermal nevus is linear and forms plaques, usually unilateral. They are usually pruritic and appear inflamed and hyperkeratotic. The first appearance is after six months of age. Porokeratotic eccrine nevus appears as warty keratotic papular lesions, mostly on the palms and soles, but in some cases they may appear all over the skin.